Hi, I'm Karen McNeil, and welcome to WineSpeed.com's People to Know, insider interviews with the most fascinating and important people in the wine business. And today we're in the Willamette Valley talking to Tony Soder, who is the proprietor and winemaker for Soder Vineyards here. And uh, Tony, I know you started your career in um, California, and we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but you also studied philosophy at Pavona College, and I, I was thinking to myself, is wine philosophy, in a sense? Well, I'm not so sure. Um, my exposure to philosophy was um, a little disillusionment, uh, if, you, if you will, mm. um, that uh, existential plight was uh, going to leave you with a few choices. And one was law school and advocacy for the sake of advocacy. And, that didn't appeal to me. And the attempt to find meaning in life uh, ultimately came down to me to uh, be something that you had to create for yourself. And to be in some kind of creative endeavor, I think, is the lesson I took away from studying philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I was accidentally lucky enough to find wine and find the fascination in it. And that's what's uh, kept me going, both professionally and existentially. Well, it does have meaning, wine, right? It, it, there's the practical aspect of it, but then there is a, I think, a larger meaning. A lot of people make the case that it's a socializing uh, exercise to share wine and mm. food, of course, and uh, I couldn't agree more that it's, um, it's something of the glue of uh, humanity, mm. maybe the best parts of it sometimes. And is that what moves you about wine? Is that, what, is that its appeal? Nothing makes my day more than when I hear from somebody who has a wow moment with a bottle of wine that I've made. You yeah. know, that I've touched them um, in a way that's visceral, not from all the reading or score mongering that you can do, but uh, somehow emotionally they've been touched by that creation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's gotta be a big high. I mean, it has to feel so good to do that. <laughs> Hey, that's, that's my wine. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's um, affirming for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also um, endlessly fascinated with um, nature and what little we know of it and as much as we try to work with it um, and to work better with it. Um, it's a wonderful, endless challenge and Mother Nature deals you a new set of cards every season, every week for that matter. And, um, and so it's uh, constantly refreshing and, and um, energizing kind of endeavor. Mm. And uh, the intricacies of making fine wine is um, it's quite challenging and quite uh, preoccupying, shall we say. Yeah. Humbling, I'm sure, as well. Particularly when you work with Pinot Noir. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely humbling. Uh, and it, it is today, even though I made my first Pinot Noir in 1980, and I don't even know how many years of, that is. That's 40 years ago or something like that. Yeah. Well, speaking of years ago, so you, you started your, your um, career, or one of your um, uh, early endeavors was working at Stag's Leap Winery in, mm. in the Napa Valley. And did you, you were a young man then. Did you, do you have, did you have a mentor at that point? I was fresh out of college, and that was my first full-time job, which only lasted a few months in one vintage 1975. And uh, it was not a mentor-mentee relationship. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it might have been a difficult place then, but I know that, I mean, for, for me, the first time I met you, I think, was when you started a Tude winery mm -hmm. in, um, in Napa, and you were known for both Pinot Noir, maybe principally Pinot Noir, but also Cabernet. And at that time, I remember thinking, wait, nobody makes Pinot Noir and Cabernet. Those are, those are two Apart from viticulturally, those are two different mindsets in a way. They're two different people in a sense. Yeah, I think a lot of us used to think in those terms that um, there were Cabernet makers and they would never deign to deal with the finicky Pinot Noir. And the Pinot Noir people had to have a little bit of crazy or something to yeah. uh, endeavor. And, and um, I think of them as the yin and yang of, of, great, of the great wines. And um, if you're trying to get your self in, in a certain balance, it's an attempt to be open to, to both sides of your brain, both sides of your emotional makeup. Um, and uh, somehow that by extension, you can, you can make a story around the Cabernet side of you or the Pinot Noir side of you. Um, and they are so different. Um, 
But living in Napa, one couldn't really ignore the fact that uh, it's God's great gift to growing pe- uh, Cabernet. Mm. And it really wasn't Pinot Noir country, as we, we learned the hard way. Mm. Um, yeah, but, um, but the lessons are there. And I started Etude because it means a study, as you know, and then in classical music, um, etudes can be compositionally pretty um, um, pedantic or they can be pretty expressive and meaningful and uh, beautiful. Um, so it was a good analogy for an approach to learning the craft, I think, which is what my early years were all about. And I used etude as that kind of vehicle. And Pinot Noir, all the more the vehicle because it's so unforgiving and transparent. And uh, just the slightest nuance of imbalance is sort of a, a, a sore thumb in a Pinot Noir where a charismatic grape like Cabernet or Syrah or something else could um, just brush it off and you'd hardly note it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So the demanding nature of it and the transparency made it a great way to learn about the craft. Yeah. Well, that sort of leads us into, I mean, you were, many people, industry observers in the 80s and 90s would have said you were at the absolute top of your game. You were uh, a, not only a winemaker, but a consulting winemaker for some of the most prestigious Napa Valley properties. I mean, Spotswood, you know, just incredible properties that you had a very uh, important um, hand in in their success and and yet you decide at that point 20 or so years ago that you're going to move to Oregon mm-hmm. um, did you ever say to yourself I think this is the right thing to do but this might be a little crazy because you, you right you could have gone on to continue to um, consult in for for all of the these top uh, Cabernet producers for quite some time. It's true. I had great relationships and wonderful experiences, and and uh, I feel some significant accomplishments with um, Spotswood, Schaefer, Araujo, Viader, um, Dalla Valle, also um, Moraga in Southern California, which is where I met, met my wife, and my life changed. So. Yeah, and so then um, you decided, though, that you were going to come to Oregon. Yeah, um, we were. We both uh, learned that we were raised in in Portland. Oh, that's right. I forgot you were raised and, here. And um, so we have roots here. And I think when we contemplated starting a family, uh, uh, we felt like it, we wanted to be back in Oregon, and we wanted to be in a place where we could afford to buy property, which was, you know, prohibitive in in Napa, as you might imagine, for somebody who started dragging hoses for minimum wage. So. Um, in any event, um, it was a fairly bold mood. Plenty of people thought I was crazy, but um, in the course of my some 40 some years in the industry, it's been setting goals and certain um, milestones. And when you get there, you have to kind of reinvent yourself uh, periodically. Mm. And I'm sure you can relate, and many successful people find ways to um, move ahead with new projects or new, new things they want to tackle. And I think when I decided that uh, it was um, I'd give up uh, consulting. That was something I really loved doing, and um, to concentrate on Etude. And then we had a chance to uh, sell the Etude brand, and there was a quite a turning point there where it was um, an opportunity to pursue this uh, re-envisioning of what our life would be. And it would be raising children. It would be uh, growing our own vines on our own property. And uh, we found this marvelous piece of property and started to make the move. Mm. It turned out to be a 10-year transition, <laughs> so it wasn't yeah. from the time we found the first piece of property in, in uh, Oregon in 1997, um, months after we were married in the middle of 96. And then 2007, we had two children and an uh, opportunity to get them out of school and into school to Portland. So it, there was it was a lot to, to, you don't leave 30 years in Napa very easily, right? So, uh, no. But uh, here we are 22 years later here in, in Oregon and uh, pursuing um, the dreams that both Michelle and I had for this property to have a, a small domain with uh, um, a very a personal uh, commitment to it and values that uh, support that and attract kind of customers that uh, appreciate the quality of the work we do and the way we do things. and. Um, um, and there are endless challenges in, in uh, 
in Oregon and in Pinot Noir and, and uh, growing a business that now has 30 employees, all of whom were half my age. Or, and, uh, and That's all right. They know a lot more about tech. Than you know. yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's good. But they're, they're building careers around something like this. And we did that all through this last 10 years with the recession. And I think it's really kind of a, um, on a kind of accomplishment that I wasn't thinking um, was something that was ever a preoccupation. Yeah. But, you know, when you do get dependents like family and children and employees, um, it does order your priorities a little differently. So. And, and, and so how did you know, though? I mean, it's one thing um, for, you know, to think, all right, we're, we're going to move out of Napa, we're going to have a property of our own, we're going to be um, in charge of our own destiny, in a sense. Um, but at that time, the Oregon wine industry was not where it is today. It, 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 people weren't writing glowing articles about mm. Oregon Pinot Noir, or certainly not Oregon Chardonnay at that time. Did you know, I mean, you knew fine wine. You, you were working for great estates. Did you already feel like, no, there's something there. This is going to be a great region. Um, that's a, um, a fun question to answer because uh, I think I did have an in intuition that um, I had the confidence and the tools uh, to make it work here, that I could, say for myself that um, 20 years before, um, when you were talking about the early days of uh, David Lett and um, Ponzi working through a lot of lessons, you know, uh, the real pioneers of Oregon, um, there were a lot of mixed results. And I was not at all confident that uh, I could figure out what would, what would work consistently. Um, but. 20 years into my career, I felt like I did have some uh, sense of, uh, of the skills necessary. And they involved as much farming as they were winemaking. And uh, with that, I thought we could bring a level of viticulture um, that wasn't really here 22 years ago when we got here. And I think we started to raise the game and uh, create the kind of possibilities for um, success year in and year out. And it's mostly about rigor and sacrifice of crop levels and, and uh, putting a lot more effort into, into the viticultural side of growing the wine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you also, um, I mean, much of your career has sort of overlapped um, at, with the time when there was the rise of sort of the great American critics. Mm. Um, did you ever, um, do you feel that your, your winemaking was, was ever influenced by critics? Were you, were you able to kind of tune those critics out? Or was it sort of inevitable at that time that everybody would be somehow subliminally influenced? Um, it's hard to be objective in, entirely in that. And it's important to the success of your business to interface with those critics if you are even lucky to get a chance to. Um, um, I can remember um, having to write Robert Parker, a, a stern little letter just to correct a few things uh, about who I was and wh who I wasn't, you know, in his presumptions. And um, I think I've maintained a pretty independent sense about the critics because they are only human and they only have, you know, certain prejudices. And, and uh, um, it's, it was easy to see um, people being driven by, by some of the ratings. Um, it's also easy to understand if you're paying attention to your own critical creative impulses that if they don't fit, then there's no point in, in, in pursuing it. So 100% new oak doesn't make sense to me. 15% mm. alcohol doesn't make sense to me. I don't care what kind of rating it gets. You know? So um, it's OK to um, have them in the world. I think the American wine industry would not be where it is in the world stage without the likes of Robert Parker and The Spectator. They really did offer us a, a great um, uh, audience, you know, and so that we should be grateful for that. And there's a certain tyranny to the ratings and the, and the biases that they have. Um, well, we, li we live with that, because that's the other side of the coin, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I love what you do in the industry, because <laughs> it's really about um, your readership and your consumers and uh, the education you do. And I think you always have that bent about what's right for the people who are on the consuming end of this. And 
not necessarily, um, I don't think I'll go there. It's, 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 it, I don't think you compete with um, uh, the likes of um, the critics um, with only numbers as the, as the bottom end and the bottom line. And, and that's uh, a lovely thing because I think you're still trying to tell stories that are, mm. make it more interesting ultimately than, yeah. than a uh, score sheet. Yeah. Speaking of stories, in a sense, um, the large story of wine is, is that it is good for a culture. It's good for a society to have wine. Do you, do you think so? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, why, why do you feel that way, though? Um, well, I think one of the most simple examples is that uh, a glass of wine will loosen your tongue, and uh, you're likely to be more civil and, uh, and uh, uh, courtship and, and camaraderie are both, both I think, uh, are enhanced by a little glass of wine. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Definitely that is the case. We all know that, <laughs> I suppose. Um, so when you think about your... Um, you know, very significant success, both here in Oregon the last 20 years and then before that in Napa. What, what character trait do you think you possess that has been helpful in that success or led you to that success? Character trait. <laughs> You're asking me to be rather self-aware uh, um, here. Um, Um, I'd say something on the order of um, learning how things work is important to me. Sharing what that is is important to me and uh, making things from nothing in the world is uh, quite an endeavor. And if you can muster hundreds of people and thousands of vines and countless variables uh, with Mother Nature, it's a, it's a lovely challenge. And if the result is something as sublime as a good glass of wine, and um, then there's a real um, emotional return on that, some meaning in life, and sharing that with others who could do the same for their their family and their um, properties or whatever is a, a, just a wonderful endeavor. Um, so I think there's a bit of a teacher in me, and there's uh, certainly a student, um, and, um, and an endless fascination with why we're here and what we're doing. Mm. Um, I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't say that uh, my wife and partner, and very significant partner in terms of our aspirations for this property in the last 22 years, was always setting the bar high. So there was a mistress to serve and with great, great ambitions. And uh, so there was, it's lucky if you can have somebody like that. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, our total interview, our complete interview with Tony Soder is at winespeed.com on the People to Know page. Please read it. I think you'll really like it.